All right. So uh, if you're here today, hopefully you tuned in to learn more about how we can better protect our organizations, especially when it comes to protecting our passwords, which are often the keys into our businesses and our networks. If you're here for some other reason, you're probably in the wrong place, but you can stick around anyway if you'd like. All right, I am gonna go ahead and get started. Just kind of quick ground rules. I will do my very best to pay attention to the chat. If there is something you wanna ask throughout the presentation, please do not hesitate to put it in there. I'm happy to pause and answer a question. Otherwise, we'll certainly allow time at the end uh, to answer any questions that people have. And you can also always unmute your microphone and just speak if you wanna do things the old fashioned way. All right. So just a quick uh, kind of couple of notes on who Paragus is. We have been around for almost 16 years. We are just under 50 full-time employees. We're located in Hadley, Massachusetts, kind of right in the middle of the I-91 corridor of Massachusetts. And our focus is on supporting small and medium-sized businesses in New England by helping them either take care of all of their IT needs or supplementing the IT staff that they have internally. We are an employee owned company, which means that everyone you work with has a vested stake in the success of the relationship and everything that we're doing. Uh, to our employees, Paragus is not just their employment, it's also their retirement nest egg. So the better we do as a company, the better we serve our customers, the longer we're in business, uh, the more successful they are. One thing that we always like to make sure that people understand about Paragus is our commitment to making IT fun. This is truly the thing that kind of differentiates us and is the, um, a real attribute of how we operate. From Morgan Freeman recording our phone tree to the way that we interact with our customers to the different things that we do to try to make sure that technology isn't intimidating or frustrating, but really helps businesses grow, expand, be more successful. That's our ultimate goal. And that's kind of what we mean by this concept of making IT fun. And then the last thing I'll share with you about Paragus is that our company is divided into four divisions. We have one division dedicated to providing on-demand support. This is the help desk that you might call when your computer suddenly doesn't work or something goes wrong. It's also the center where all of the alerts that uh, we're monitoring go to so that they can be looked into and addressed. Our second department is focused on security and compliance. That's a little bit of what we'll be talking about today, but as you can all imagine the world that we live in, this is a very important topic. I think we probably all watched the gas pipeline play out in the news. Um, and that's a really good example of where bad security and lack of compliance led to some pretty severe uh, consequences. The next department is focused on strategy and planning. So IT is one of those things that we always need to be kind of looking ahead. We know when equipment's gonna to need to be replaced. We know that more and more things are moving to the cloud. Uh, and there's a lot of other things that we want to be strategizing and planning for. Should we have our network on premise or should it be in the cloud? Should we keep using our phone system or should we move to Teams? Should our data be in OneDrive or SharePoint or on our local network? There's a lot of questions and a lot of choices when it comes to technology. And this department's job is to help our clients see the forest through the trees. And then finally, our newest division that we just announced uh, a couple of weeks ago is our business automation division. We've done several webinars on this topic. Those webinars are available on our website if you want to check them out. But this department is focused on helping clients use technology to be more efficient, either to have access to data and intelligence that they don't have access to, or to automate systems and processes that right now are manual within their businesses. Uh, and this is a brand new division that, like I said, we launched just a few weeks ago and has already had a tremendous amount of interest uh, and is now has a backlog of work. All right, so enough on Paragus. Now let's get down to the topic at hand. What we're going to be talking about today is one of the ways that hackers and kind of bad actors can get into your network and cause your business harm. One of the things that we're going to spend a lot of time on is looking at the risks of passwords. So I've got a couple of stats here. Uh, the average employee logs into 10 applications each and every day. That is often 10 different passwords that they're managing. However, most people can reliably remember only 
three unique passwords. So in many cases, these 10 different systems they're logging into, they're either using the same password or only a few passwords, or maybe some slight variations of that password. Now, studies show that users uh, access an average of at least four applications or website using the same password. So kind of if you've got 10, you can only remember three, approximately four or more of them are gonna be the same password. And then unfortunately, one third of users are still guilty of either writing down their passwords while an appalling 69% of users admit that they've shared their login credentials with other users. Now, there's a difference obviously bet between sharing your Netflix password with your kids and sharing your Windows Active Directory password with a coworker. However, when we dig into this, we often find that there are many, many cases where users are sharing passwords that do allow access to fairly confidential systems. Now, in some cases, that's because there isn't another way to do it. There's no way to create two different user accounts or nobody knows how to or has ever looked into it. So they're just sharing one user account. Uh, but in other cases, it's not even for that reason. So despite all of this, 64% of organizations are continuing to rely on passwords as the primary method of user identification. And this is what we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about today is this kind of concept that this model is inherently broken. The model of just having one form of authentication, a single password, knowing that that password is gonna be shared with other people, knowing that that password is gonna be used for multiple systems, knowing that that password is probably not all that complex in the first place, it's not a foolproof system. And we've seen that play out over and over and over again as hackers continue to go after small businesses because in many cases, it's not that hard to do so. So how are all these breaches happening? So we hear about these attacks all the time. I am sure there's people on this call who have experienced some sort of a breach or incident within their own business. So where are they coming from? 17% of them are coming from email compromises. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later today. One of the most common things that we're seeing happening right now is one user in your business will get an email that says something like, you have a voicemail message that you need to click to listen to, or somebody sent you a secure document they want you to open up. And it's gonna come from somebody you trust and know. This isn't a hacker using a fake email address. It's gonna actually come from somebody you do business with, somebody who you email with regularly. Because of that, you're going to click on it. You're gonna open up the attachment. You're gonna to go to the voicemail. And when you do, you're gonna get prompted with a generic login screen that's gonna ask you to log into uh, Window, Microsoft 365. You are not gonna think twice about it because you're getting used to logging into Microsoft 365 on a pretty frequent basis. So you're gonna go ahead and do so. Here's my username, here's my password, log in. Now, what you're gonna find is that you don't have a voicemail, you don't have a document. But what you did just do is provide a hacker with your username and password to your Microsoft 365 account. What that hacker is then gonna do is within as short a window of time as possible, they're going to log into your email. And when they get in your email, they're gonna send a very similar email to everybody in your contact list. And what they're doing is this is called a credential harvest attack. They want to keep sending the email as many people as possible. And every time they get into one mailbox, that gives them another source of sending it out to another hundred or thousand people. And then they get into maybe 10% of those people's mailboxes and they send it out to another 10,000. What they're trying to do is just capture as many usernames and passwords as they possibly can in as short a period of time as possible. Typically, these attacks will last 24 to 48 hours. Once the attack is over, they'll sell that data to somebody on the black market. So they'll say, I have a database that has 180 valid Microsoft 365 credentials that have been harvested in the last 24 hours. The less amount of time the data, you know, the younger the data is, uh, and the more that they have, the more valuable it is, and the more they can sell it for. That particular thing might sell for a couple hundred bucks, maybe a thousand dollars, depending on how many uh, credentials they have. So a couple of hours of work, hacker makes a thousand dollars, sells it to the dark web. You will occasionally have malicious insiders. Those are typically disgruntled employees or in a growing number of cases, employees that are being paid by a hacker to provide access to the network. We've seen a couple of hospital-based attacks where that was the way that it happened. You still see supply chain issues. These are actually very similar to the email compromises, but in this case, what the hackers done is they've gotten into your email or into your supply chain's email, and they send you an email that looks like a real email, but it's asking you to wire money to somebody. 
they might say you have an invoice overdue. They might say you missed a payment. They might say that we need to deposit or an escrow amount. And they're going to try to get you to wire money to an account that you wouldn't normally wire money to. We still see you know, a huge amount of phishing attacks. And I would lump the phishing attacks with the business compromise emails because they often go hand in hand, as do the 19% of compromised credentials. All of those are very similar types of attacks, just using slightly different technologies. Missing cloud configuration, the most common instance of this is poor security in your 365 tenant. And we're gonna talk about that a lot today, but the number one thing is not having multi-factor authentication. If you don't have multi-factor authentication in your 365 tenant, you are incredibly vulnerable to the types of attacks that we've just been talking about. So this just tells you a little bit more about the phishing, just to give you a little bit more context and perspective. 44% of respondents have been the victim of a phishing attack at work. So if you think about that, that's almost half of your organization has fallen for a phishing attack at some point using their work email address. That's an appalling statistic. And on the one hand, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, we do want to work on the user education and the training as well as testing to try to lower that number. Because as long as this number remains high, hackers have a huge advantage. At the same time, the more we can do to make sure that when the hacker is successful at that phishing attack, they're not actually able to get something that helps them, uh, that has a huge impact. And we'll talk about how we can do that. And then 51% of respondents have been a victim of phishing attack in their personal lives. So this isn't just happening at work, it's also happening at home. There's emails that say you have a FedEx tracking number. You'll have an email that says there's been a problem with your Amazon delivery. There's emails saying your Netflix account is about to expire. There's a lot of these personal emails going around that flood people's inboxes and that frequently steal their credentials as well. Now, the personal one wouldn't normally concern us, However, if we go back to my point earlier of people reusing their passwords, it's a very high probability that the Netflix password or the Amazon password that your employee is using to protect their home account might be very similar to the account they're using to log into your system. If a hacker gets access to one, they are smart enough to try that password at a lot of other places. And so while we don't necessarily care about what happens in people's personal lives as it relates to business security, we do if they're using the same passwords and if there's no other protections to stop hackers from getting into the business network. And so the point here is that if we keep relying on passwords as being the single source of authentication, and we are making it so easy for hackers to get access to these passwords, Hackers don't have to do the hard work of trying to break in through the firewall or create some sort of you know, special exception where they're getting into an old SharePoint server or they're doing something creative. They can just walk right into the front door. They can log in just like your employees do. They can go to office.com, click log in, put these in password and they're in your network. And then from there, they can further their attack and get deeper and deeper and deeper into your network, whether that's logging into your remote desktop server, whether that's starting to log into some of your other applications or whether that's emailing your employees to trick them into continuing to give more information to the hackers. And that's why this topic is just so important. We can't leave our front door wide open. So these are some of the common attacks that we have been seeing recently. Um, there's been a lot of phishing attacks associated with these various companies. Uh, and there's two kind of things we have to be mindful of. On the one hand, a hacker can impersonate one of these companies. So very frequently, we will see an email that goes out to employees, says it comes from ADP. Email says something to the effect of uh, either we need you to update your direct deposit information, or we have a updated W-2 for you. Obviously, that attack works really well in the February timeframe. When employees click on it, they're either going to be prompted to provide credentials. Those credentials will then be used for the hackers to log into the real ADP system and then actually change the direct deposit. And then the ADP uh, will start sending that person's paychecks to the wrong account. Or they're trying to get you to install a virus on the network to let the hacker in. 365 is probably the biggest vulnerability and the one that we see the most common attacks for. I'm going to show you in a second why it's so important that you don't let hackers know that you're using Microsoft 365 and how you can hide that. And then there's a bunch of other ones here. I'm sure many of you have seen these attacks and these emails come into your inbox. 
where they're trying to get you to log into LinkedIn or to update your Dropbox because there's a problem with your Verizon bill or your payment didn't go through with Bank of America. All of these scams are just becoming so frequent and they've just, the, they're incrementally growing in terms of volume because they're working. We are so, so, so far away from the Nigerian prince asking us to give him a million dollars. So just a couple of more stats and then we're gonna to go to the solutions. Uh, over 80% of hacking related breaches were linked to weak reused or stolen passwords with 32% of those breaches directly traced to phishing. So let's think about that. That means that 80% of incidences are related to, to bad password etiquette and 32% are linked to people just willingly giving out their password, not, act, you know, not intentionally in most cases. Um, but that's a third of all the attacks that we're seeing are just people responding to a phishing email. And 80% in total can be linked to bad password etiquette. That's a lot. And that, you know, we often talk about cybersecurity as being really expensive and saying, oh, we got to spend so much money to protect our network. There are some cases where cybersecurity can be really expensive. And that last 20% can be very expensive. But let's focus on the first 80. If we don't have good password etiquette, there's no point in talking about the expensive stuff because the front door's open. So we don't need to go around wiring up all the windows and putting glass pressure sensors and motion sensors because the front door is open. So the focus really needs to be on, let's get the 80% out of the way, and then we can start to continue to improve and make continuous improvement over time to continue to make that gap smaller. 19% uh, of people who open a typical phishing campaign demonstrated a willingness to submit requested data. This number is getting better and better because the hackers are getting better and better. The better they make that attack, and the more we're used to seeing emails like this, the more likely we are to fall for it. So right now, the success rate is almost 20%. That means a hacker sends 100,000 emails out, and they're going to get a really high number of respondents back, which, again, they can turn around and sell that data very, very quickly. 63% of all data breaches can be directly or indirectly linked to third-party vendors. This is most commonly Microsoft, ADP, some of those vendors I showed you earlier. And then less than 20% can be traced to the old school stuff. This is the stuff that we used to worry about. People using key loggers and backdoors and tracers and viruses, those still exist. And by all means, I'm not telling you to turn off your antivirus. Please leave it enabled. Uh, please continue to renew it. But that's the 20% now. It's not where the most of the attacks are coming from anymore because hackers have figured out people are easy to fool. Let's just go after them. All right, so I've scared you thoroughly, hopefully. Now it's time to kind of change gears a little bit and talk about how we can prevent these things from happening. So there's a few things we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to talk about multi-factor authentication, often called MFA, what that is, what that means, how you can get it, the various options that are available. We're gonna talk about single sign-on or SSO. You might not have heard about this one before, um, but it's a very important technology that we wanna talk about. We're gonna talk about password servers. These are things like last passes that you might use in your personal life, but we're gonna talk about the ones that are designed for businesses. Security awareness training, I already alluded to this earlier, and then email security services. So these are the topics that we're gonna really look into today. So let's start with multi-factor authentication or MFA. So what multi-factor authentication is, is it's requiring there to be a second form of authentication beyond a password. Now, most of you, I would imagine almost everybody in this call has had some exposure to this. You've tried to log into your bank's website and they've texted you a nine digit code or a six digit code that you've had to type into the computer to get into the bank's website. That is a form of multi-factor authentication. In addition to your password, you also had to prove that you were in possession of the cell phone that's registered to your account, were able to get a text message from that phone, which presumably meant you could unlock the phone, not always if your security is not very good, and that you were then able to type that code into the computer. That is a second form of authentication. Now, banks are actually using as many as 32 forms of authentication. They don't tell you this, but most banks have moved over to systems that are monitoring the IP address you're logging in for, which is basically the internet address. So it's detecting, hey, normally you log in from Amherst, Massachusetts, but today you're logging in from California. That's abnormal. We're gonna consider that a risk factor. Whereas when you do log in from Amherst, they consider that a form of authentication, one of their 32 checks. Believe it or not, they can also check to see when you typed in your password, did you one finger type or did you five finger type or 10 finger type or eight finger type, whatever it is that you normally do. 
It can detect how quickly you typed in your password. It can detect whether you capitalized your username or didn't. Sometimes it doesn't matter. And so when it doesn't matter, they'll detect whether you normally do it one way or another. Sometimes they'll have that picture, like the little image that you're supposed to recognize. And if it isn't the image, you're supposed to kind of throw up a red flag. All kinds of stuff that is actually happening to help us authenticate. But that's what a bank is doing. Most of you in your businesses are not doing any of those things. Unfortunately, there are still an enormous number of businesses that are simply relying on a username and a password. Now, our usernames are not that creative. Typically, their first initial last name or first name, last name. A hacker within four guesses can guess your username in almost every case. So the username doesn't even really count. That leaves us with the password. Now, if I use the same password for everything and a hacker only has to hack one of those things or get it once, then they have my password. And that's why this multi-factor authentication is so important. There's different types of multi-factor authentication you can use. The two that we're going to talk about today are push notification and text message codes. So the text message codes, I already told you, that's when you get the text message that says enter in this code. You go back to the computer, you type in the code, and you hit enter, and it goes in. Push authentication is what you see on the screen here. This is where, when you go to log in, something pops up on your phone and says, hey, are you trying to log into this website? And you just say, yes, I am, or no, I'm not. If you say, yes, I am, it tells the computer, hey, yeah, I checked. It really is that person. Go ahead and let them in, and then they can go ahead and go in. And the one thing I do want to say about both the push notification and the text message notification is it's important that your users set up your cell phones correctly. If users can see their text messages on an iPhone or Android that is locked, meaning they have not entered the code or put their fingerprint on it, or this notification can pop up when the phone is locked and they can approve it while the device is locked, that actually can be quite dangerous because if you're at Starbucks and somebody grabs your computer and your cell phone and runs out the door, they can self-authenticate. They can provide the MFA token. And so what you want to do is make sure that not only are you using MFA, but that the token, if it's going to be cell phone based, is behind the lock screen. And that's an easy setting to change. You can even enforce it globally at the security level. And again, if there's any questions at any point in time about any of the stuff I'm talking about, by all means, feel free to unmute or post in the chat. Uh, and otherwise, we will have some time at the end. So the next technology we want to spend some time talking about is this idea of single sign-on. Single sign-on, what it does is it limits the need for an employee to have to keep track of 10, 15, 20 passwords. And I'm going to show you a demo in just a few seconds about what that looks like and how that works. But the basic concept is I log into one system. Once I log into that system, I have access to all the things I need to have access to. And when I click on those, my system tells that that I am who I say I am and lets me log in without me having to keep track of a separate username and password for that system. What that prevents is that I don't have a password out there with all of those other vendors. So those vendors get hacked. They don't have my password because I don't have a password with that vendor. It's also nice because if I have to fire that employee or I remove that employee's access to that system, they don't have the password. They never had the password. There never was a password. And so by not having a password, I don't have to worry about that employee going home and trying to log into that system on their own, especially now that more and more of our systems are out there in the cloud. The next thing is this concept of a secure password server. And again, I'm going to show you a demo of this as well. But this is basically the idea of like a LastPass, I can have one system that remembers all my passwords for me. But in a business environment, there's a couple of advantages. What I can do is I can record all those passwords as an owner or an IT manager or a CFO or an HR manager, and then I can decide who in the company has access to those passwords. So maybe we only have one username and password to log into our Staples account or our Amazon account, and there's four employees that need to have access to that. Rather than giving them the password, I can put that password in the password manager and give them access to it. When they go to that website, they'll be able to log in but they won't know what the password is, which means that if I need to terminate that employee or change their department, they will no longer have access to it because they never knew what the password was, decreasing my need to constantly change passwords. It also means that we're not writing passwords down in sticky notes, we're not putting them on our monitor, we're not putting them on our Excel spreadsheet because the passwords aren't needed anymore. All you have to do is connect into my computer, press the button, and it's gonna bring me into that website. And then security awareness and training. So we've talked about this a little bit already, but basically the concept here is that companies like ours can run frequent tests on your employees. Uh, in most cases, it's a monthly activity. 
And we're going to use a combination of mostly phishing and sometimes a little bit of vishing. Vishing is when we call somebody to try to get their password instead of emailing them. And also a little bit of spoofing. Spoofing is when we pretend to be one person and try to get somebody to do something they're not supposed to do. By running those tests on your employees, we are able to do a few things. Once we can figure out where your kind of IT intellect baseline is, 80% of your staff don't fall victim, 10% fall victim, 5%, you know, whatever that number is. And then for that percentage that does fall victim to these types of attacks, we can do training with them. Individual training, group training, one-on-one -on -one training, self-directed training, online training, whatever kind of training we want, there's a lot of opportunities and uh, options available, but it means that we can help to try to improve the IT intellect of those people. At the same time, we gamify the thing. Because staff know this is going to be happening once a month, they know they're going to be tested, they don't want to be on the loser board, so to speak, it starts to kind of make a game out of it where staff become extra diligent and careful because they don't want to end up as one of the people who falls for it. And that has to do with, so these are the as example of a simulated phishing a campaign we might run. So we may run a campaign where we send an email that looks like this saying, hey, there's been fraudulent activity in your Microsoft account. Uh, click here to accept the login or block the login. Doesn't matter whether you press accept or block, you're going to get brought to this page. It's going to ask you to log in. And when you log in, we're now going to have your username and password. So this is an example of a phishing attack we might send to your staff to see if we can trick them. And then the last thing I want to share is email security. One of the things that is critically important, vitally important to businesses these days is you need to have your email being filtered by a third party company. Many, many companies used to have their email on site. When they had their email on site, they paid for some service to filter their email. There was a company way back in the day called Barracuda who this was a huge part of their business. And there was other companies that came out around that time as well. And then after them, some of them were on premise, some of them were in the cloud. But the idea was when we had our email on site, we almost all of us had it filtered. Because if you didn't, you'd get a million spam messages a day. When companies moved from on-premise to the cloud and went to Microsoft 365, a lot of them thought they didn't need to filter their email anymore. They thought Microsoft was going to do that. Well, Microsoft can do that, but it's an additional product that you have to buy. It's called ATP, or Advanced Threat Protection, and it costs uh, 4 to $5 per month per user to add that on to your Microsoft licensing. Most people don't. So most people are using the version of Microsoft that does not include the filtering, but they think that their email is being filtered. And the reality is it isn't. And so as a result, a lot of really bad things are getting into your inbox. Those things could be phishing attacks, they could be spoofing attacks, they could be viruses, they could be malware. All of the stuff that you don't want to end up in your users' inboxes are getting through because the email's not being filtered. The other risk of not using email filtering is the entire world can see that you're on Microsoft 365. So this is a free website that anybody can go to. And anybody can go to mxtoolbox.com and type in their domain name right here in MX Lookup. When you do that, and I hid this user just so we wouldn't embarrass one of our customers, but when you did this, I can see right now that this is the email is delivered to mail.protection.elk.com, which is Microsoft 365. It also tells me right down here, the email provider is Microsoft Office. So anybody, doesn't have to be a hacker, you could do this right now. You could go to mxtoolbox.com, type in your domain name, hit MX Lookup, and you would be able to see where your mail is going. The problem with this is, if I can tell that your email is going to Microsoft, I know one of two things. I know two things. One, I know your email is probably not filtered because most people who have their mail go to Microsoft are not filtering it. And two, I know that you're using 365, which means I can send you 365 phishing attacks. And I know that they're going to make sense to your users because I know that that's where their email lives. If you're using an email filtering service that is not Microsoft, what you'll see here is the name of that company. So I'm going to see Proofpoint or Mindcast or Reflection or Sophos. And what that's going to tell me as a hacker is, oh, man, these guys have a security system. It's the same thing as like putting that sign on your front lawn that says this house is protected by ADT. It tells me that I have to get past a security system if I want to get into this company's network. That will deter a significant number of hackers right there. But again, it's not worth it. Let's just keep looking for people who don't have filtering. So for those two reasons. One, to deter hackers from even coming into your, to trying to go after users. And two, from making sure that hackers don't know that you're in 365, it's worth having email filtering.
But then that's before you even consider the value of having your email filtered to remove all of that stuff that you don't want to get past your uh, users. All right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you guys a quick demo of a particular product that we have been using called Passly. And what Passly does is it addresses several of the things that we just talked about. It has an MFA component, it has a single sign-on component, and it has a password server component. Uh, so I'll leave it there and go ahead and start the demo. Peace of mind for a business owner means the business continues to grow safe from risk, no matter the situation. But growing cyber threats are made more complex when managing a remote workforce. Passly, a secure identity and access management platform, eliminates the biggest reason for any security breach today, which is stolen user credentials. You can secure your business with secure password server, multi-factor authentication, single sign-on, dark web exposure alerts, all for a minimal cost. Passly ensures the right employees access the right resources securely, anytime, anywhere, from a desk at work or a comfy couch at home. Let Passly secure your peace of mind. Hello, welcome to the Passly demo. My name is Jeremy Mallon. I'm the Director of Product Management for the Digital Risk Protection Platform for ID Agent. Let's go ahead and take a look at the system. So I'm logged into a Passly instance here. Uh, you can see when I initially log in, I'm, I am given my launch pad. This is my, my launch pad for all my single sign-on applications. So I mentioned we have a couple different flavors, a couple different buckets of single sign-on applications that we support. Uh, some of them like Salesforce, uh, Bamboo, uh, and others support single sign-on. And I'll show you how those work uh, in just a second. We also offer support for, for applications that don't support single sign-on, for web pages that you may need to access, whether it's bank accounts or shopping sites, Ingram Micro, I don't know about Macy's as a business application, uh, as well as just other applications that haven't added support for single sign-on like WebRoot. Uh, for those, you just click on the link. It's going to take you to the site. It's going to try and push your credentials through. I don't have credentials to valid credentials to WebRoot, so I'm going to get a log on air here, uh, but you can see it's pushing my credentials through. Uh, for other applications that do support single sign-on like Salesforce, uh, let me go to another window here just so you can see. If I go to my Salesforce logon URL, right, and I click this, you'll see it's going to actually redirect me back to Passly uh, for me to authenticate. So when I come in here, I'm going to give it my credentials. Uh, and it's going to... Assuming you put your password in correctly, it's going to log me in and it's going to take me back and log me into Salesforce, right? So it's got that redirect. One of the nice things with, with uh, applications, a lot of the applications that support single sign-on, be it SAML or OpenID Connect, is within those applications, within Salesforce, for example, I don't have a password, which means that there's no back door for me to be able to get into that application to be able to access that data uh, if I'm not supposed to be. Right. If, if, if I leave my group and I go to a different group uh, in, in the organization that no longer has Salesforce access, it'll be removed from my launch pad and I, don't, I won't be able to get into it. If I leave the organization, my account gets disabled, my only access to that application was through Passly. So when my account gets disabled, my access to Passly is also disabled and I would lose access to it. There's no backdoor because there's no password. Right. Uh, when it comes to protecting your machines, this is done. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take a look at the policies here just to show you what a sample policy would look like. Uh, there's an agent involved here as well that, would, that we'd use to roll it out. Uh, but let's, let's look at the policies here for a second. This is our most basic Windows login policy. This is what I would refer to as the MFA every time policy. When the user signing in, have them enter their Windows credentials and then require 2FA. If you're going to roll this out to your machines, this is the most secure policy uh, you could be rolling out. Highly recommended that this is the type of policy you would roll out to all the servers that you manage, right? We do have the ability to add in other criteria here as well, though. Uh, so if you want to, you know, there's that fine line I always talk about between secure and convenient. So if you need to go more towards the convenient side, uh, we also have the ability to set up policies, something like this. 
uh, if the device is not trusted, then require 2FA, and then go ahead and trust the device for a period of time. Uh, recommendation would be something along the lines of 16 hours, which I call this the MFA once a day policy. Uh, so every 16 hours, you're gonna be required to enter another MFA challenge, right? This, this 16 here obviously is, is parameterized. So you can set that based on you know, your risk threshold as well as you know, taking into account any compliance needs. Depending on what industries you're gonna, you're gonna be working with, right? That risk threshold is gonna vary. In some of the, the industries that have more compliance requirements, uh, they may wanna see that number down a lot lower in the, in the one, two, four hour range. In others, it may be fine that it's every 16 hours. Uh, it's up to you and your customers as to where you need that to be. Uh, once you've got your policy or policies tuned, you can have multiple policies here. So you can have different policies for different machines. Uh, you would go ahead and set up your agents, roll those out through your RMM tool. Uh, the last thing I'm going to take a look at is our password server. Uh, I mentioned this is where it's about protecting your credentials. So in here, this is vault based. If I go and take a look at a vault here, uh, you're going to see it is group based in the permissions, a little bit more granular as far as the permissions go. Uh, so by default, a group that has access to the vault will have read access and they would only have it up here in the password vault link up at the top. Uh, but if there are groups that you want to give more privileges within a certain vault, this isn't to password server as a whole, this is within this one vault, uh, you can do that. So if you have your uh, HR passwords or your networking passwords, you can give the people that, that you know, the trusted individuals, the trusted group access to, to more, more privileges within those passwords. Uh, within a password, very simple, very straightforward, obviously name, descriptions, uh, you tell us what type of password, that'll define the, the fields on the right. So if it's an Active Directory password, you'll see things like username and domain. If it's a database password, you'll see things like machine name and database type. All the way down to if it's an SNMP password, you'll see you know, authentication profile, encryption profile, and then we have two passwords here for this one, both the auth password and the privacy password. I mentioned before, if it's an Active Directory or a Windows password, uh, you'll also get this sync agent option here. Uh, this, if you install this either on the local Windows machine where the password is or, or on a machine with access to the Active Directory. So one of your, your local ones can double as the one that, that uh, syncs the uh, Active Directory passwords. Uh, we can have those passwords set up to rotate. Uh, that can either be done a certain number of minutes after access or when they expire and you define how frequently they expire. We have organizations that will set this as low as one day to expiration. Every night, we will change their password automatically, right? Make it easy, make it simple, make it so that you, the, the techs that, that are coming in here to look at these passwords don't, don't have the ability to create that spreadsheet of passwords that they need to, that they need to maintain. All right, and just a couple of quick things and then we'll move it over uh, to questions in just a few moments here. So this is just another screenshot of what that password server can look like. This is the single sign-on page where from the launch pad, you can see this user has access to all of these utilities. They can click on it and it's going to log them in. Now, what he was talking about is with the MFA a day or the MFA every time you log in, the idea there is that if you're gonna use the Windows password that all of us for the most part have to use anyway, as the one password that is then gonna give access to everything, which you can do, uh, then what you would wanna do is make sure that that password is super secure. So in the example he gave, when the user went to log into Windows, they actually had to use MFA to log into Windows. I would bet most people on this call are not using MFA to log into Windows today. However, if you get to that point where you're using MFA to log into Windows, now you've elevated the trust of that initial login to a very, very high level. From there, we can just use that trust and pass it forward to all the other applications. So that once I've authenticated at that level of trust, I can just go to LinkedIn or IT Glue or Azure Portal or Office 365, and it's not gonna ask me for my password because it's already confirmed that I am who I say I am and my password is gonna be passed on. This is another shot of what that password manager can look like. You can have individual password vaults that are just yours. So like, let's say that I'm in a company, I might have Delsey's passwords, I might have HR passwords, I might have financial passwords, and then there might be a folder called all user passwords. And so depending on kind of what groups I'm a member of, I can have passwords from different groups. And then I can also have my own passwords that are ones that sites that I log into that I don't need to share with anybody else, but I wanna control them here. The benefit of doing that and having kind of passwords kept here is that 
I can set my passwords to be really complicated, long passwords that I don't even know. So those of us who maybe use LastPass or another password tool, you may have used the password generator before, or even on an iPhone, it will often suggest a password for you. And it's usually a very long thing with like broken up by um, dashes. The reason you can use passwords like that is because the password is stored here. I don't know what it is. I go to Amazon, I go to log in, I press the button, say enter my password, it puts it in for me. And that way I can use these really crazy long passwords that I use a different one for every website that no hacker could ever get. And if they did get, they would only get access to that one site because I have a different one for every single site. But that doesn't work well if you don't have a manager to keep track of it. And that's why these password managers are so helpful. And then there is a Chrome extension. So when you install this under your Chrome uh, environment, you get this little plugin that looks like this. So right from my Chrome extension, I can see the applications I have SSO access in. I can click LinkedIn and it's gonna bring me right to LinkedIn and log me in, or I can go to my passwords, which are the websites where my password is being stored for me. It can't log me in, but it can give me my password when I go to that site. And so every user gets this installed in their Chrome extension. And then finally, the last screenshot I'll show you is just, this is what it looks like when I get a Passly authentication. So when you are using MFA with Passly, uh, and I wanna log into something that MFA is required, either in the Windows or into a certain application, uh, or maybe I'm connecting to my RDS environments. So like at Paragus, we're not allowed to remote into the building without going through a multi-factor authentication. When we go to do so, this pops up on our cell phone. It tells us who it is, what IP address they're coming from, uh, and what time it is. We confirm that, yeah, that's exactly right. That is me, I am trying to do that. And we hit this giant allow button with our finger uh, and then it lets us in. Suddenly the login screen disappears on the computer we were trying to log into and the Windows desktop shows up. Um, so this is an example of what the Passly MFA login tool looks like. All right, so where do you go from here? Well, obviously the point of this webinar is to let you know that we're here to help. Uh, these are technologies that we have spent a lot of time learning about and researching, and our job is to help you navigate them. So whether you're not sure where to start, because I've obviously just thrown a lot of information at you, from email filtering to cybersecurity training for your employees to MFA to SSO, that's a lot of stuff. And I think one of the things that can be a little overwhelming is well, where do we start? How do we begin? What does this journey look like? So if that's where you are, we can certainly help. Or if this is just too much to figure out, you've got a lot of things on your plate, you're trying to run your business, you certainly don't wanna get hacked, but you just don't have the time to do all the research and figure out what makes sense for my business. We can come in and help you to answer those questions, ask you a couple of questions, make some recommendations and help you figure out what makes the most sense. Or if you're just still confused, if coming out of this webinar, you still feel like you don't understand what I'm talking about, this still doesn't make sense, you don't know what an SSO is, you still don't know what MFA is, that's fine too. Uh, you know, we have the advantage of studying this stuff every single day and using it every single day, but that doesn't mean that it's going to instantly make sense to you. So if you're still just confused and just have questions, by all means, we're here to help you understand this and make sense of it. And so ultimately, the way we like to describe ourselves and the way we describe ourselves in a lot of these webinars is we want to be your Sherpa. It's your business and we want to get you to the top of the mountain, uh, but we're there to carry the heavy load, to look around the corner, to guide the trail for you and make sure that we get you there safely. So from here, there's a couple things we can do. We can help you figure out what the right solutions are for your business and what makes sense, either from a risk standpoint, a compliancy standpoint, an insurance standpoint, or just from a best practices standpoint. Any one of those might be driving the decisions and technologies that you need to implement. We also then can help train your team. We know that these systems are only as good as the implementation. So we can help your team get used to using MFA, figuring out how to set up their passwords, really educating them about not only the what, but the why, helping them see why this is so important and how it helps everybody. And then obviously we're there to make sure that everything is working. So when you can't log in one day, when you forget your password, when you're locked out of the system, we're there to help and make sure that your business is still running and that all of those hiccups are resolved. All right, and so with that, we have almost exactly 15 minutes uh, available for questions. So I will open it up the, uh, the floor. You can post in the chat, you can unmute whatever you guys have. The one person is asking, how does this compare to Microsoft MFA? That's a great question. When Microsoft first came out, they had a paid version of their product where you could use multi-factor authentication. Then several years ago, they made it free. So if the only thing you were trying to do 
was to put MFA on your email. There actually is a free product from both Microsoft and Google. So no matter which of the providers that you're with, as long as you're with one of the two major cloud providers, there is a free technology out there that's provided by the company, Microsoft or Google, that can provide authentication into those two systems. If you're gonna do nothing else, please, for the love of God, do that. We've actually gone as far as requiring our customers to do it because it stops so much of the low hanging fruit attacks that we see all the time. We go back to the conversation I was talking about the 80-20, this is the 80, and this will kill off a lot of those types of attacks. However, if you're gonna go in deeper and you wanna start putting MFA on other things, workstations, applications, if you wanna use SSO, then we would recommend that you consider something like Passly so that you're not juggling two different technologies. The Microsoft Authenticator only works for Microsoft products, mainly 365. So it's great if that's all you're trying to secure, but if you want to secure other things, then you don't want your users having to bounce back and forth between two or three different MFA products. Um, so again, if you're not going to do anything else, please use the free MFA that's included in Google or Microsoft. We're happy to help you set that up if it isn't already set up. If you're not a customer, we're happy to have you become a customer. Um, but that's the minimum, that's the base. From there, we would start encouraging you to think about beyond the email. How do we start to secure the other parts of our network? Um, if the gas pipeline company had been using MFA in a couple different places, they would not have gotten ransomware. Somebody's asking, do I have any opinions on LastPass versus Passly? Long and short of it is that when companies are born, they're born of, as either a consumer company or a business product. The business products sometimes try to spin off as consumer products and the individual products try to frequently spin off as business products. However, natively at their core, they're one or the other. LastPass was designed as an individual product. It has great features. I use it personally for my, all my own personal passwords. And as an individual product, it's phenomenal. The, cons the business version of LastPass called LastPass Enterprise um, is not as robust as something like a Passly in some areas. It does not give you all the same tools that you get. And the sharing is a lot more complicated. When I want to share a password LastPass, I go to my vault. I say I want to share this with somebody. It sends them an email. They have to click on the email, go to their vault, hit accept password, log out of Passly, and log back in before they can use that password. That's a lot of steps. It's not seamless. And so my professional advice, LastPass at home, Passly at work. Any concern with single sign-on being a single point of failure? So it's a great point. All the data and science and research on this topic has said, if single sign-on is done right, it is more secure than users having multiple passwords for all the reasons we talked about. When they have multiple passwords, they start sharing them in different places, they start reusing them, and then it is really one password. But the disadvantage is when that one password gets out, instead of somebody getting into one thing, they're now into all these things, especially if there's no MFA. So would I do SSO without MFA? No, absolutely not. That would be just further consolidating my risk profile. However, if I'm using something unique like Passly that hackers are not commonly targeting, and then I put MFA on top of that, and I do good MFA, like we're talking maybe MFAing every four hours or every six hours or at least once a day, I'm really creating a limited risk profile um, and then what I'm doing is I'm preventing users from having password, which means when I, if that user needs to leave the organization, if they change departments, if anything happens, as we were talking about a little bit in that demo, there is no password. There's no back door. There's no way to get into my Salesforce because the only way into my Salesforce is through my last bat or is through my Passly. And the only way my Passly is by having an MFA token that is super strict and super well regulated. So there, you know, it's one of those things that it has to be done right, but done right. SSO in conjunction with good MFA is definitely more secure than having a bunch of different passwords out there. Somebody asked, should I use separate Passly app for my personal activity? So you don't need to use a separate Passly app. You'll have the Passly vault uh, where you can store your own passwords in. However, here's the catch. Unless you're the owner of the company, you always have to worry about when you eventually leave that company, you retire from that company, something happens to you, you're not taking your passwords with you. So they're great for passwords that you use personally for work. So your personal login to Amazon, your personal login to some company state website that you have to log into. I would use it for things that I'm logging to that are still work related, but are my personal login to that work related thing. I would not use it for my Netflix account. Then I would use LastPass uh, because 
my last pass belongs to me. If I leave the company, if something happens to the company, those are my passwords and not tied to the company. I don't have any relationship there. Uh, so that's kind of where I would draw the line. If this is something you'd still want to have access to after you left the company, keep it in something like LastPass. If it's something you use at work and would not need when you retire, keep it in Passly. Cost of Passly varies a lot on what you want to use. It can be as little as $2 per user per month. Uh, at most, it's $5 per user per month. So you're kind of in that price range. Um, and it just depends on whether you just want the MFA or whether you want the MFA, the SSO, and the password manager. Uh, and at least when it comes to Paragus, it depends on which one of our contracts you're in. If you're in a contract where labor is included, then it's a little bit more because there's a lot of labor associated with it that we have to build into the price. If you're in a contract where labor is not included, the price is a little bit lower because we don't have to build in the cost of labor because you're going to get billed for that time separately. Any other questions from anybody on the call? All right, well, then I'm going to go ahead and leave it there for today. But by all means, if anybody has any follow up questions that they want to ask offline, we are more than happy to answer those questions. You can email me. If you're a client, you can email your team member, uh, and we're happy to answer those anytime. Or if anybody wants to see a demo or learn more about Passly or any of these other products that we've talked about today, please let us know. Um, as we like to tell our customers, it's not in our best interest to protect you from getting hacked. We make more money when you get hacked. But it's not fundamentally the kind of business we want to run. We want to make sure that our customers are safe and secure. We'd rather provide value in ways that make their business better, not help them recover from really terrible attacks um, by people who are stealing their money. This is recorded. Anybody who is registered will get a copy of it. And within about 48 hours, it will also get posted to our website. If you haven't checked out our new website, I would encourage you to do so. There's an events button you can click on, or the, I'm sorry, there's a button called the latest that you can click on. If you click on that, you can then click the events and you can see a, a copy of all of our webinars that we've done. Also, you can check out our new podcast called Podigus. Uh, we just published episode five, and we're going to be publishing episode six very soon. That's a great way to learn about technology from the perspective of CEOs of many different kinds of organizations. So I will leave it there. And if anybody wants to follow up, please just let us know. Thank you so much. And I hope you guys all have a great rest of your week.